Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jim Islib. I'm a MSU Extension field crops educator based in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. <clears throat> and I'm hosting this morning's virtual breakfast session. Glad you could join us. If you are interested in receiving MDARD pesticide applicator recertification credits or cro certified crop advisor uh, educational credits, we need to have your full name on the sign in. And if you signed in with something other than your first and last name, uh, you, can, you can fix that by clicking on the participant icon, finding your name and clicking on your name and a little sign that says more will pop up. And if you click that, it says rename. And if you'd give us your full name uh, because we have to verify that people attended the meetings before they can receive those credits. I want to mention that uh, you're, you're welcome and encouraged to, to um, give your questions to, to Scott Bales when, when he's doing his presentation and also to Jeff Andreessen during the weather. And please use the chat box for that. You can uh, click on chat and type in your question and we'll address those questions and speakers will address the questions when they're done uh, with their talks. The, the uh, information you'll need for Pesticide applicator research credits uh, is going to be presented and provided to you after the weather report right around 7.30 uh, this morning. And also, we have a monthly evaluation effort for people who participate in these virtual breakfasts. And in the chat box, you'll find a link to that evaluation. Uh, and, and please take a minute to respond to that. We ask for it once a month. It's important to our team to have feedback from participants about the program. You'll also find in the chat box a link to a voluntary demographic um, information uh, page. And we also like to get some information about the people who attend our programs. Matter of fact, we're required to, to ask for that. You're not required to give it, but we we really would like to get some demographic information from you uh, as a participant in today's program. I think I've covered what I need to cover and I want to get our speaker uh, on um, without any more delay. So I'll stop sharing my screen and ask uh, you Scott Dale. Scott is our MSU dry bean specialist. He has statewide responsibilities to uh, serve the dry bean growing uh, community. So Scott. It's all yours. Thanks, Jim. So I think I'm pulled up here, uh, but thank you for that introduction. Uh, once again, my name is Scott Bales. I am the MSU Driving Specialist, um, and this position is a partnership between Michigan State University, uh, Ag Bio Research, MSU Extension, as well as our grower-funded Michigan Bean Commission. Um, and today we're talking about driving planting considerations, and really I consider this the, the resources and the tools for success. Um, for our upcoming dry bean planting and growing season. You know, I'll start this off with a, a quote from Yogi Berra. Um, it's a rather simple quote, but you know, I think it's definitely very applicable to our dry bean systems. And it goes, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else. You know, in a crop that's you know, 95 to 100 days start to finish, um, I think this, this really resonates with me. Um, it's important to have a plan uh, for all these upcoming situations that we may have. Because um, in that short season, we definitely don't want to trip and stumble. Um, and if we do, we definitely want to have a plan of how we're going to get back up uh, to keep that crop moving forward um, and have a successful growing season, especially with competitive grain markets. Um, we want to make the most of our driving systems and bring the most value we can to our farms um, from this production. So some key take home points that we'll cover today um, is variety selection and placement. Um, we talk a lot about variety selection, you know, back in December and January when we're making those seed decisions. I know a lot of those seed decisions are already made and hopefully that seed is, you know, sitting in the shop ready to be planted. But I think the part we don't talk about a lot is placement um, and how those varieties can actually be placed on your farm. You know, when you have a few varieties, you know, there in the seed shed um, and some different fields with some different field histories. We we'll also cover planting rates and conditions. Um, and then we'll look down the pipeline a little bit. You know, what's next? What do we need to keep an eye get out? the audio on my phone. Or as we're coming coming through the growing or season. And also some helpful tools, you know, as we're, we're looking at these things and maybe you discover something in your field and, and we're not quite sure, 
you know, how to manage that or, or what our plan of action should be. So talk about variety selection and placement. Um, I always think it's super important to utilize all of our available resources. And coming from a little bit of a bias standpoint, I believe our you know, Michigan driving performance trials are one of these best resources we can have. Um, these can be found at michiganbean.com forward slash research. Um, and I'll put a few links into the chat when I finish up here so that everybody can have those uh, to take a look at later. Uh, but here's an example of what is available in these reports. Um, this is an example of our black bean variety trial. Um, each year we'll test somewhere between 80 and 130 different lines across 10 to 11 different market classes, depending on the year. Um, and for each of those, we'll look at maturity, yield, we'll average those year, yields over locations as well as years. Um, and then we also evaluate, you know, some disease resistances or tolerances uh, for white mold um, and thracnose if applicable, as well as give those a lodging score. Um, so when I think of placement, I think this can be, you know, really important. We had some conversations with a grower yesterday who had the variety black beard as well as specter. You know, you had some fields with some different histories from a fertility standpoint, such as manure applications, um, as well as what he believed to be a white mold risk. You know, when we looked at those white mold scores for black beard and specter, and you know, we determined that those specters would be a better fit for those fields that he felt were a little more high risk from a white mold standpoint, um, and black beard was a better fit for some of his other production. Um, so I think those are really key considerations that we do make um, as we're on these final stages of, you know, final preparation as we put these beans in the ground. Because once we pull that planter in the field, um, it's kind of the point of no return. Uh, so we definitely want to make sure we, we've thought everything through and we have a plan of action heading in. So then to move on to planting rates and conditions. Um, we're a, we're a little past what I would consider early planting at this point, but we received this question enough over the past two to three weeks I, I thought it warranted discussing. Um, and that, that question, is there an advantage to early planting? Um, and in my mind, what I would consider early planting, to put a definition on that, would be the third or fourth week of May here in the state of Michigan. Um, and a few of the key, key considerations that I do make when we talk through that question, uh, the first is always soil temperature. Um, 60 degrees soil temperatures at two inches is my threshold for dry bean planting. Um, once we cross that, I, I kind of check that box off is, you know, we're okay to go from a soil temperature standpoint. Uh, the next question is soil moisture. This has been a big question for a lot of us this year in the Thumb Saginaw Valley as well as around the state. Um, as we're looking at, you know, dry weather, hopefully some of this rain will come through this week and, and help alleviate those issues. Uh, but as we're losing soil moisture and all of a sudden our seed placement needs to come deeper and deeper and deeper to, to get those beans into moisture, you know, there, there comes that question, do we plant early while we have that soil moisture um, at a reachable depth uh, for planting? Then the second would be upcoming weather, weather patterns. Um, this one is always the most difficult to predict. Maybe Jeff will help us out with that. Uh, but it, it kind of comes down to what do you believe this weather is going to do um, as we look at our you know, planting window, as well as what that weather will be like during flowering uh, for these different flowering dates um, for an early versus standard planting. And the fourth one that's come up quite a bit too um, is what impact do we have in our wheat planting dates and planting rates as well? Um, if we decide to, you know, plant early, you know, why we had moisture or if, you know, a grower decided to wait and, you know, potentially roll the dice a little bit for a rain and, and see when that moisture does come around. You know, what potential impacts can we have there? Um, and we won't cover too much on that, but it is just an important thought uh, to have in your mind as we make these decisions. You know, to look at that first box of, you know, soil temperature, um, I pulled two inch bare soil temperatures from the research farm here in Richville for both 2019 through 2021. Um, and I was somewhat surprised what I found um, through the, you know, the 10th and 11th of May, we were somewhat on par with the past few years. Um, I know we had a lot more crop in the ground probably on May 10th this year than we had in the past few years. Um, to, and we've seen some of that response to those 50 degree soil temperatures. Uh, but since that date, you know, 2021 has really brought those soil temperatures up. Um, and as of the 26th of May, you know, we were sitting well over 65 degrees for that two inch soil temperature. So from soil temperature, um, I believe we have crossed that, you know, necessary threshold and puts us in good shape uh, for our for seeding dry beans um, into these Michigan soils. 
You know, and we haven't looked too much at the, the actual result of, you know, what we consider an early a standard or a late uh, planting date here in Michigan, but our friends over in North Dakota have. Uh, they studied this from 2012 to 2015 uh, with what they would consider an early planting date, which would be May 13th to May 23rd, a standard planting date for them at May 27th through June 5th, um, and late being June 12th to June 18th. Um, and they often do push things a little bit on the earlier side in North Dakota and Minnesota compared to here in Michigan. Uh, they have a bit of an earlier frost date in the fall, so that it's kind of a necessity to them. So our eye always tracks over to you know seed yield 100, 100 weight per acre. Um, and we find that that actual 100 weights per acre were not significant for these trials over those years, you know, looking at multiple market classes of pinot, black, and navy, uh, ranging from 18.9 bags per acre up to 20. Uh, across those three planting dates. But what I'll take a look at a little bit deeper here and some of my more heavily considered items uh, would be that, that plant stand or plant density. Uh, oftentimes we know that you know establishing a stand of dry beans is easier said than done uh, given weather conditions. Um, and you can see when they did push things earlier they had a slightly thinner stand than when they were at their standard, standard uh, seeding timings. Um, so that's always an important consideration um, if we are thinking the other one that I, I was surprised to see was their planting date to emergence, um, as well as an emergence to physiological maturity. Uh, so what they had found is that those beans that were seeded early sat in the ground for up to 15 days. Um, and with that, you know, emergence to physiological maturity date remained the same. Um, so what that did is that actually, you know, reduced some of that advantage that they had to that early seeding date. Um, as those beans, you know, sat in the soil and waited to emerge due to those colder temperatures. You know, and last year is a, a good example of, you know, some of these beans that might have been planted from June 5th to, say, June 8th, seem like they emerged here in Michigan anywhere from, you know, four to five, maybe six days. Um, and in my mind, I think that is a perfect situation. Uh, the, the shorter the time that seed is in the ground not emerged, the better off I feel we are. Um, if we had beans in the ground for up to 15 days, I'd be very worried about those stands. Um, so it, these are very key considerations to make when we're thinking about early planting. You know, and then the, the last one we'll touch on is that, you know, weathering during weather during flowering. Um, so what I did here is, you know, I pulled the, the average weather from 2012 to two, 2020 uh, for the Kindy Mon Station looking at just our high temperatures uh, from a period from the 1st of July through the 1st of September um, and those low nighttime temperatures for that same period. You know, and if we drop in our, our average flowering date for a bean planted the third week of May, you know, we'd flower in early July. Now, if we push that back to the third week of June, we're looking at a, a start of flowering somewhere in early August. Um, I was somewhat surprised to see that these temperatures didn't trend down farther than they had. Uh, we're looking at you know about two and a half degrees on average uh, if we look at that trend line for both those you know, high and low temperatures. Uh, but these are you know important considerations as we generally think of a, a cooler period during you know flowering and pod set and pod fill to be advan be an advantage for a dry bean crop. Um, you know a, a week or two of you know above normal temperatures. Um, during that flowering period can have a severe impact on yield. So these could be you know, very important considerations to make you know, when we're thinking of planting early versus our, our standard seeding times here in the state of Michigan. So then we'll move on to discuss planting rates and conditions um, and mainly addressing the, uh, the question of what population should I be seeding? So last year to, to build on some previous work, um, in close collaboration with uh, Dr. Marty Chilvers, our field crops pathologist, as well as Dr. Kurt Steinke, our soil fertility specialist, you know, we established a trial in four locations in Michigan. Uh, these locations were Sanilac, Huron, Tuscola, and Bay County on farm with grower cooperators, uh, looking at three different planting populations and a factorial arrangement with four different nitrogen rates. Now, the goal of this trial was to look at what those planting populations and nitrogen rates could have an impact on our white mold severity and infection. And, you know, luckily for our growers last year, we didn't have a ton of white mold infection. Um, so we didn't have, you know, great results in this trial to look at what effect that may have on white mold infection. Uh, but what we did get was some really good agronomic data 
uh, from both those increased nitrogen rates as well as planting populations, which we'll stay focused on the planting populations for the purpose of today's talk. Uh, those three planting populations in 20 inch rows that we used was a low of 100,000 seeds per acre, a medium of 130,000 seeds per acre, and a high of 154,000 seeds per acre in those 20 inch rows. And I'll show our nitrogen rates just for you guys to have an understanding of what we were looking at doing. Uh, based on you know, different cooperators and what their you know, capabilities were, we had a low of a zero pound nitrogen check all the way up to 100 pounds nitrogen per acre. So we're really looking at you know, pushing these rates beyond you know, what we would ever you know, consider for dry bean production uh, to see what that potential influence was on what yield infections were. You know, what we had found with populations was that planting population was very often not significant. In fact, it was not significant at all locations except for our Huron County location. You know, and to remind you what those populations were again, it was at 100,000 up to 154,000 in 20 rows. You know, and we'll look at that data out of Huron County. Um, you'll notice these populations on the bottom are a little bit different. And this was our actual harvested plant population, what our final plant stands were. So that 100,000 came down to 77,000 plants per acre, um, and that high was down to 102,000 plants per acre. And you'll see we're looking at this yield in pounds per acre. Our yields were well over you know, 3,000 pounds per acre or 30 bags. Uh, we had some really exceptional yield potential at this location that we did not see in our other locations where population was not significant. Um, so anecdotally, what we have found is that populations over 70,000 plants per acre are often sufficient for average driving production. When we start talking about very high yielding production conditions, you know, over 30 bags per acre, you know, we may have an advantage to have a few more plants in that stand uh, where that 92 to 102,000 plants per acre uh, may have an advantage versus those populations in the 70,000 range. And then just to take a look at, at nitrogen use rates, uh, we have a picture here on our left of a zero pound check um, over in Bay County and then a 50 pound nitrogen use rate on the right. And what we found is there's often a, a very you know, large visual response to increased rates of nitrogen. However, these yield results often do not um, you know, trend or favor that really increased rates of nitrogen when we get over what our current recommendations are. So if we pull this all together, um, yield can respond to increased rates of nitrogen um, in absence of white mold. And I think that's one of our biggest considerations there. Uh, when we do get in some white mold conditions, you know, those, those higher use rates of nitrogen uh, really I don't think would be a, a beneficial use to our system. Um, and Kurt's group has done some extensive work at the research farm here in Richville. Um, and we, what we've determined is that we really want to, to stick with that current recommendation from MSU of 40 to 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre um, as a standard use rate for Michigan dry beans. And to look at our populations, you know, most often populations above 70,000 plants per acre did not significantly affect dry bean yield um, under average production conditions. But we do get that question too as we look you know, maybe we've seeded 100,000 plants per acre and we've seen some adverse weather conditions um, and maybe we didn't get quite the number of beans out of the ground that we expected. Um, so what about those lower populations when we're really looking at replant decisions? So we methodically put out a trial last year too, uh, looking at, you know, reduced seeding rates rather than increase. Um, so for this trial, our highest seeding rate was 117,000 plants per acre. Um, and we trended all the way down to 39,000 plants per acre. You know, so we're looking at you know, less than half the stand for that. Um, and once again, yields represented in pounds per acre. Um, and what we had found is we did not significantly lose yield um, until we really got down to this 39,000 plants per acre um, from our you know, highest here, 78,000. You know, and what this related to was a 17% yield reduction from a 66% stand loss. So it really changed how I looked at you know, replant decisions. Um, and it's important to you know, consider the uniformity and health of that stand uh, when we're making those decisions, as well as the date on the calendar that we're making those, those choices. Um, but dry beans at very low populations can still compensate very well um, and yield you know, better than expected, in my opinion, um, given these, these low plant stands. 
Um, and one very important consideration to make too was that weed control was maintained under these low populations. Um, and that could be something very difficult to do in a, a field scale um, rather than plot research. So then to kind of finish talking about planting rates and conditions, um, the majority of our you know, Michigan dry beans are seeded into what we consider to be conventionally tilled. Um, I am very interested in looking at some of these conservation and strip tillage systems. Um, and I, I would encourage everybody to, to always experiment on farm. Um, and especially in a year like this, when we're looking at you know, potentially limiting soil moisture um, and concerned a little bit about opening up that soil um, to, to lose some of that moisture. You know, but most importantly, it's always to find a system that works for you and your farm, um, and especially focus on you know, weed control when we start looking at you know, reduced tillage systems and, and how do we still get those pre or PPI herbicides on that crop and maintain control. You know, and here's just a, a quick picture of, this is actually a field of light red kidney beans. Um, it looks more like a field of water hemp in some spots, um, but this field was you know, maintained with the the utmost intention of being a perfectly clean field, but water hemp had a different plan for that this year, last year. Um, so it, it's an important and emerging you know, issue in the state of Michigan. Um, and a, a quote from Dr. Sprague to always start clean and, and do our best to maintain this um, and use the tools that are available, such as our 2021 weed control guide for field crops. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we have Christy on too, if anybody has questions. You know, and then to, to kind of look down the road to stay, stay aware of some, you know, arising issues. And it's always what's next. And to me, once we get past, you know, planting and our initial weed control applications, um, it's looking at insect management and foliar disease management. And I know it's always easier said than done, but I don't think there's any replacement for scouting uh, when it comes to these two issues to, to stay in our bean fields and have an idea of what we're finding you know, what our pest levels are and to know what those thresholds are prior to making applications. You know, and as we look at that, some helpful tools that we do have available. Uh, the first one would be our insect management guide uh, that Dr. Chris Defonso has put together uh, with some help from myself. Um, looking at, you know, some of our different insect pests, you know, our overwintering stage, when we should really be scouting for these, as well as some recommendations in that. Um, I'll put a link to that in the chat after this as well for you to have for your resources. Second one would be our 2020 uh, Michigan Dry Bean Research Report. Uh, this is available on the Michigan Bean Commission website as well. Um, has results from all these trials that we discussed today as well as many more um, and some of our other you know, campus specialists such as Kurt, Christy, um, and Marty. And then I always encourage folks to, to try out the Sporecaster app when we're making white mold decisions uh, to plug your information into this and see what our risk levels are when we're considering making these white mold applications um, as we get into flowering. Um, to, to help validate, you know, some of our decisions one way or the other. And with that, I just pose the question, where are you headed um, with this driving production system? And if you have any questions or, or want a hand making some of those choices, uh, always feel free to, to contact us in the chat, uh, or if you feel better sending an email or a phone call later today uh, or anytime, um, I always welcome those. And with that, I'll wrap up. Well, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, uh, for their presentation. So let's take a look at what's come in on the chat. Um, one question from Wayne, why is my wheat a lush green directly over my tile in two foot strips and somewhat yellowish elsewhere? He applied 90 pounds of actual N in the form of urea in early, early in March and went back and applied an additional 45 pounds in the form of urea, then applied 30 pounds in the form of 28%. Of, uh, and uh, I'm going to ask if any of my colleagues, I don't, I don't have much tiled ground up in my area, and I'm not real fresh on that topic. Anybody want to dive in on that question? Yeah, this is Dennis Pennington. Um, I've seen the uh, same situation happen where wheat over the tile lines actually looks better. Um, and Dennis, you, you conked out. I think he muted himself. That was a good cliffhanger, though. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, you have to unmute yourself, please. Well, maybe we can get to that afterwards, Jim. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, we had a comment. Uh, Wait, Dennis, Dennis is unmuted now, it looks like. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there. Um, 
Yeah. Did you get any of that response or not? No. You were just, you were just telling us that you've seen the same thing. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, so, yeah. So the, the only thing that I can come up with on the, why the wheat over the top of the tile lines look better is because we've been very dry. And if those roots are making the line, they're able to get some additional moisture um, and, and to grow better. Uh, that's the only thing I can come up with as to why they might be doing a little better over the tile line. Um, I did see a field that had look that would, that had new tile put in, um, and it was done with a trencher that uh, brings the soil up to the surface, um, and then it kind of lays it out. And so I think we might have brought up some soil from the subsurface that was uh, maybe a little nutrient deficient. Um, so right along the edges of the tile, uh, it didn't look quite as good, but uh, right over the tile line, it looked real good. So. Um, yeah, kind of a strange phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Uh, next question uh, from Clay. He, he, I believe he's asking if seven and a half inch rows with higher seeding rates uh, would be good to capture more sunlight and close the canopy quicker. That one's for you, Scott. Yeah, I'll tackle that one. Um, so yeah, we do have some beans in the state that are drilled, um, and those canopies do close, you know, very quickly. And when we talk about, you know, weed control, there there definitely can be some advantages to that, um, you know. And, and we kind of go back and forth that, you know, depending on what your management system looks like. If you know, it's a lot of our organic growers, you know, are out in twenty or thirty inch rows to be able to get that, you know, in crop cultivator through there. Um, so there, there's challenges to both sides, but, you know, seven and a half is definitely a, a strategy we've seen some guys adopt and can work well for your system. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Then we got a couple of, of weather questions. One, when is the cutoff for precipitation being taken into account for the U.S. drought monitor that comes out each Thursday morning? Right. It's, and as you can, I, from the question, it's, it, indicates some understanding of, of, of the challenge that the folks that put this together in Lincoln have. And so it actually, it's actually quite a bit after the fact. And uh, the actual issuance of this product is on Thursday mornings each week, but it reflects conditions up through the previous Tuesday. So we're already now for what we just looked at here uh, in, in our weather briefing, we're all about a week, at least a week out. So it is, it is in the, the past a little bit. And of course, some of the recent rainfall is not reflected uh, in that. So it's, it's a good question, but it is unfortunately, that's the best they can do uh, putting all that, that information together. So there's a couple of days lag. There, yeah, and, and when we look at it, because we, we of course meet early on Thursdays before the issuance, we, we have to add even more time, at least in, in terms of that product. Most of the rest, we try to get whatever we can right up to the moment. But, uh, but for the drought monitor, it's only issued every Thursday morning. And so we're, we're, we're about as far behind as, as you can get with, with that one relative to when it's issued. And Bruce would like to know if there's any chance some of the rainfall that's been stuck in Nebraska and Missouri can make it this far east. Well, that's, that's certainly the hope. Uh, we, we've seen a pattern over the last, the last week, which was, uh, well, it was very frustrating again because we could see all of that all of that moisture almost within sight, visible sight uh, of Michigan. And it just was to the most of it was to the West or ended up to the West of the state. Uh, that is, that's not typical to see that go for a long, long period of time. And I, I will, we'll see right now. It's I, I'm still, I'm still optimistic that we're going to see more frequent rain than we have. Uh, the other, the other thing I think a factor here when we look at the, the drought conditions in Michigan is that, they, they're not localized, but they're fairly, it's a fairly small area. And I think that still hopefully bodes well for later on that we, we do see a pattern shift and more frequent precip and, and, and more of it than we have. We've had some bad luck for the last uh, several weeks and for a number of reasons, a number of weather systems just did not materialize or some cases they got close to Michigan and, and just, just did not move through like they typically do. Hopefully we'll see a change in that, but we, and we will need to because we're, again, we're down on moisture at the beginning of the season, and that's not a not a, a typical situation for us, and not where we would we would like to be. 
Okay, one kind of follow up on that from Bruce. One other quick question. What are Lake Michigan water temperatures like? Seems like the lake is uh, taking the punch out of storms. And it, it actually, because of the early warm up, it actually is a little bit warmer than it typically is. I, I looked uh, yesterday and the water temperatures range from the 40s in the far northern part of the of the lake uh, to the 50s over most of the, the north south extent. And, and but there are some even now some 60s down along the far southern part. So uh, it depends on, on where you are, but it's actually a little bit of ahead of, of normal given the uh, the mild late winter, early uh, early spring. Of course, it's been colder since then, but but we had that early warm up and that made a difference. The other issue is we had uh, significantly less ice than normal uh, this past winter uh, across the lakes, uh, which also helps the water, the transfer of energy. Uh, to to go faster more quickly than it typically does. Okay, very good. Uh, we pretty much made it through our our written comments and questions in the chat. There was one final one about the name of today's uh, uh, topic, and it certainly was dry bean considerations. So with that, uh, I'd like to open it up. If any if anybody has. Uh, comments, questions, or issues that you'd like to bring to the group before we close down today? Jim, I did mention to Chris Stefanzo that I saw a potato leaf hopper on the screen at my house last night. And so the leaf hoppers have arrived and I'm sure that if it, the temperatures go up and it stays dry, we'll have lots of uh, alfalfa fields that will be or should be scouted to see if those Leaf hoppers have made it into that field. So just an FYI for everybody. Yeah, and I, and I had swept uh, around campus like last Friday, and I didn't see anything. And so I was in the field on Tuesday down in Dundee, Jeff, and the wind was just screaming out of the south. And I told my student, this is how leaf hoppers are going to get here. So I think Phil got, got that first one. And we haven't seen, you know, the black cutworm uh, tra trap captures have been pretty low. But if you look at armyworm, I still have ha have found none. Uh, I don't know what um, uh, Paul Paul Gross's trap captures or maybe uh, Eric or Monica. But there was a big slug of them uh, just south of us in Laporte La County, uh, just south of Berrien County in Indiana. And that's the only kind of big catch that you kind of see in Indiana. So... I'm not sure if we're going to be transporting any of those army worms up here, but uh, the, the other people trapping may, may have had more than I actually have had and because mine's a big fat zero. So I have had um, like last week I had more ones or threes. And then this week I had some that had seven. So okay. it seems like I'm, I'm getting more, but it's still not a, you know, yeah. a ridiculous amount or anything. And I just put out corn, corn borer traps yesterday so uh you know it's towards end of may start to maybe see them so i'm transitioning to other species at this point i'm not really catching anything ones and twos army worm still catching a few black cutworm someone does ask in the chat about uh when should they put out western bean cutworm traps i always put mine out at the end of june i like to get a couple zeros because i'm an entomologist i like that graph to say zero at the beginning but you know if you're right after fourth of july you'd be pretty good i'm sure scott's gonna be putting some out in dry beans as well Chris, yeah we'll have some on <laughs> we got some alfalfa fields that's getting are, are starting to look a little frosty with uh the tip feeding of uh, weevil is this cool weather going to slow them down a little bit till the choppers can get in the field? Uh, well, I mean, how many days of actual cool weather do we have? I mean, they they develop at that earlier, you know, 40, 48 degrees. If if uh, they will continue to feed, if it, I mean, it, it would have to be cool for a longer period of time for them the to actually stop no. feeding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, a, a little bit. If it's 80 versus, you know, 60, that's a little bit of a difference. But the bottom line is, you know, get as much cutting done as possible. And I have seen a lot of, a lot of fields being being cut. Uh, you know, now we're going to have some rain in here, so that cutting is going to be maybe delayed a bit today. Cut right now. After There's today, a Chris. After today. We don't want to cut today because it'll never dry that's, that's true. early that's enough. True. That's true. There's a comment so, in the chat uh, from Heidi about 
she's hearing about seed corn maggots and soybean fields and dry, dry bean fields. Uh, any thoughts about that, Chris? I'd be surprised if they were in dry bean fields. Uh, so, so um, yeah, so we, we've had a ton of issues. We talked about it last week, and then the, the Fonz facts came out. I tried to give you my explanations about early planting of soybeans on April 15th into a field full of decaying stuff because you didn't wait. That's a recipe for disaster. So we've had actually more issues in soybean than in corn. Because I think in soybean, it's an unexpected thing or, you know, you're pushing that planting date back to where we don't normally do it. So if you're going to do this early planting, you either have to wait or you're going to go to no, no, no till and not work that stuff into the, into the soil. Or you have to have good weed control in the fall uh, and very few annual weeds kind of worked in in the spring. So... Uh, this is the power of seed corn maggot. It is not well controlled by insecticides if it's there in large numbers. It will eat through that insecticide or the insecticide is simply not there by the time that it starts its, its uh, damage. So by now, if there's any re replant situations, you do not need a seed treatment on soybean in the replant situation. Whatever happened hap is, is done. And that and those flies are you know going about their business and your plants are gonna come out of the ground fairly quickly at this point. So I, I, I don't know if Scott has any uh, concerns about seed corn maggot and dry bean. I would hope that those fields are already prepared and ready to go. And you know, you're not working weeds in right now to, anyway. Scott, do you have any? Yeah, we've seen some of it, but it's mostly relatively isolated. You know, a lot of times we do have some cover crop that we're either terminating and letting it dry prior to incorporating it, or we should be incorporating it, you know, much earlier. Well, um, and that, and if it's incorporated dry, it's not an issue. Right. It has to be um, the fresh decay kind of, exactly. kind of situation. So a little bit of cotyledon feeding, that's fine. The dry beans will grow out of that. Yep. And then to bring me to my next question that I get a lot is how many days of potato leaf hopper suppression can a grower count on from our seed treatments? Oh, so from us, in my mind as an entomologist, I'm thinking aphids here. The clock starts when you plant the seed and you have 30 days barely for anything. Mm -hmm. And in corn, studies show that only 2% of the seed treatment goes into the plant. Two, as in two, not 22, two percent. And we, we think that's probably similar in soybeans. So if you planted a little bit later and you were there and you got dumped on by leaf hoppers, you probably that was your first spray. But in a lot of years, the leaf hoppers are a little bit later and you wouldn't have had that spray that early anyway. Right. So 30 and done, and that may be a stretch. And that's not from emergence, that's from planting. From planting. Yep. So Chris, Bill Stangle was talking about, they've had black cutworm in South Central Wisconsin yesterday. They've had steady flights over the past week. W will those flights ever make it from Wisconsin to Michigan? And will they blow through or not? We, we've had our black cutworm flight. It's, they're flying now. We've been okay. getting black cutworm in the trap pretty reliable for since we've started, since when? April. Okay. And so last week I showed the pictures of the black cutworms that were pretty good size. Maybe I'm using my finger here. They were about three quarters of an inch to an inch. Uh, this week in all this sampling that we're doing, I haven't seen it them any anymore. This is in Southern Michigan. So uh, I have seen a few pictures of what might have been black, black cutworm uh, on, on corn, but that was sort of already happening in some of the weediest fields. And um, the Purdue isn't even showing their numbers anymore. So the flights dribs, dribs and drabsing in, and, and we, already had lar we already have larvae there. Okay. Any, uh, any final thoughts before we shut her down today? If not, I want to thank our speakers, uh, Scott Bales and Jeff Andreessen, and thank you all for your participation and hope you can join us 
uh, next week for Dr. Yan Suk Dong talking about uh, better irrigation management and uh, scheduling, and also another another informative weather uh, uh, report from from Jeff. Uh, I hope he has better news for the UP next time. <laughs> and uh, with that, I wish everybody have a great and safe day. <laughs>